Um, welcome, everyone. Um, I'm delighted to be in conversation with Manil Sori, friend and neighbor, and a little uh, surprised to be here um, because I will just confess right up front here that um, I'm more of a word guy than a numbers guy. I believe in Plato's Academy there was an inscription on the front, let, yet let only those with knowledge of mathematics or geometry, geometry, yeah. geometry enter here. I would have been bounced out of there. You would have just walked right through. Um, so uh, keep that in mind. But I think you wrote this book for everyone and not just for math people. Uh, so I'm glad to be in conversation with you. Every book has its creation story, its backstory, even a book that is itself a creation story of a kind. Uh, so, Manil, could you start off and uh, tell us the creation story behind the Big Bang of Numbers? Yeah, sure. And uh, thank you, Eric, for doing this with me. Um, and it's wonderful that you identify as a words person more than a math to person. Totally upfront so about that. We absolutely yeah. need that. Uh, absolutely. So, um, in terms of how this book started, I actually would have to go back to when I was an undergraduate student in Mumbai. It, back then it was Bombay. And um, my algebra professor had a, uh, he showed us this, uh, this uh, uh, saying by Kronecker, famous mathematician, who said that God gave us the integers and the rest all is the work of man. And um, then he said, well, actually I can do better. I can actually create everything, y even the integers. So we don't need God at all. Uh, and he proceeded to show us how you can start with something, uh, emptiness, the empty set, and then create all the numbers, the counting numbers. And that was probably the closest I've ever had to a religious experience <laughs> because it really seemed like these numbers were just coming out of the blackboard and the walls were blowing away and, you know, suddenly it was very cosmic and so on. And um, when I started writing this book, uh, I thought, well, could I somehow do that in this book and share that with people who are not mathematicians. And that was probably my main idea in writing this book. Uh, some years back, I wrote this uh, New York Times op-ed, which uh, said, w it was entitled, How to Fall in Love with Math. And uh, the, main, the main point of the article was, people get bogged down by calculation, and it's really the ideas that matter. So I was gonna write a book about these ideas, and when I started, I said, let's start at that point and then go from there and see how much one can create just using the numbers, using the numbers for other things, and really try to track out the whole process of creation instead of leaving it in the hands of physicists or religious authorities. You know, why don't mathematicians also take some of the credit? So, um, And it's, it's an ambitious and wonderfully executed thought experiment. Um, but I want to talk for a second about this this chronic math phobia that so many people suffer from, and your notion that basically we, we, we're not thinking about math and conceiving of it in the right way. What, what do we get wrong about math? So um, I think uh, they've done studies, and certainly in the first few years of school, uh, people are generally uh, pretty good at math. Uh, and it doesn't, you know, there aren't any, there aren't some of these differences that occur later on. And I suspect a lot of it has to do with actual calculations where uh, there's a lot of drill that goes into it uh, and, and I think that's a good thing in some ways but in other ways it can also hinder people. So I suspect that somehow along the way the calculations take over and the ideas start to recede uh, and I think some of the educational uh, initiatives have tried to switch that mm -hmm. with, with some success, but not perfect success. But, but you're suggesting that math really, like philosophy, is much more about ideas than it is about calculation. And you, you write that it's where ideas, where the realm where it truly comes alive is in mathematics. So even though the language of math is largely numeric, um, it's ideas that are undergirding the numbers? Yeah, and uh, when you see a formula, for example, uh, the formula is just expressing an idea. It's a short form for expressing the idea. And um, you can um, end up you know, expanding these formulas, 
and what you end up with is a 300-page book, I guess. Uh, but you know, if you're really going to write these ideas out, uh, formulas are very succinct, and they're a way for people to convey information very efficiently. But um, they don't tell you necessarily the whole story. So uh, in this book, I was trying to think, well, if I wasn't a mathematician, how would I approach this material? How would I explain it to no other, you know, other people who aren't mathematicians? So at one point, Manil, you're right that we need to transcend our cultural training. And uh, I'm reminded of something that Steve Martin, the comedian, said. He, he majored in philosophy as an undergrad. And he said, well, when you major in anything else like biology or physics, you just forget it as soon as you graduate. But if you major in philosophy, you retain just enough to mess you up for the rest of your life. <laughs> and I'm wondering if you're suggesting that we learn just enough m math to mess us up and, and that we have to unlearn the math we learned in school in order to approach it from the Manil Sori way. Well, I don't think uh, people get uh, messed up the same way as philosophers okay. do. So, <laughs> uh, because with math, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, you're probably never going to actually encounter a quadratic equation. Day-to-day uh, -day life can be carried out very easily with just arithmetic. Uh, and so, in that sense, uh, I don't think that most people would have to really understand math uh, in the sense that mathematicians do. However, that is like saying most people don't really need to understand art or don't need to appreciate music. I mean, you don't have to, but it really yeah, and adds that, to richness. It's interesting you should say music and art because I was struck reading this book how you really use the language of art and literature more than more than the language of science, actually, I think. You talk about um, the aesthetic joy of mathematics. Uh, the word elegant appears several times in the book as in an elegant proof or an elegant solution. Um, when a mathematician talks about, say, an elegant proof or the aesthetic beauty of a, of a formula, an equation, wh what are they talking about? So uh, I think I was I, I, I think I was pretty careful uh, in this book to keep the proofs right at the back of the book, and uh, mm -hmm. there is one proof that is very elegant. And you what know, does that mean, elegant? So How is that proof elegant? Yeah, so 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 it's uh, it's elegant in the sense that something starts up and it's almost like a story where it's going a certain way, and then suddenly uh, all the pieces come together with some element of unexpectedness. And yeah. also conciseness, and uh, you that sounds see like good writing as much yeah, as anything. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and I think I think being a mathematician has certainly helped me in terms of my writing. So because I'm very concise, but uh, this one proof, which is which comes towards the uh, end of the book and is in the back, um, sort of demonstrates all these qualities. So I've just I've just chosen a few proofs that would make sense and would illustrate this. Um, that's different from uh, a different type of aesthetic, uh, which is the aesthetic appeal of uh, some, some of the ideas in math, some of the things that where you abstract something and then suddenly you can use that same idea in terms of something else. Hmm. And uh, that's the other ingredient that mathematicians, you know, we are trained to, to do. Uh, and that's what scares people as well, abstraction. Right, and we'll get to that in a second, but I want to talk about um, the way you approach the world. I, I, math is part of the STEM. I believe the M is for math, yes. um, so, but yep. you're lumped in there. But does a mathematician view the world I, like a scientist, only with more numbers, a, f a physicist or a chemist, or is there a fundamental difference in how you view the world in, in, in natural phenomena that's distinct from a, a biologist or a chemist or a physicist? So first of all, I don't think it should be STEM. It should be something like MEST or something. The math should come <laughs> first. Uh, MEST, yeah, <laughs> I like MEST. Mess. Yeah. Uh, or METS, maybe. That's <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, uh, but, but in terms of, uh, you know, looking at the way that a uh, mathematician would view things, there's something that happened with this book that really opened my eyes. And it was because uh, when you talk about creation, you really have to talk about physics as well. Mm -hmm. And so I really had to uh, go into the, uh, the uh, whole idea of creation through the eyes of a physicist. And uh, that really scared the hell out of me. My God, these people get away with murder. <laughs> it's amazing because you have all these theories, and I'm just talking as a mathematician, um, 
in math you have a certain number of assumptions and then you have to really pay attention to them and you have very strict rules in terms of what you can or cannot do because it has to you know show you have to show exactly and you there's a consistency between what uh, different people can come up with from those rules in physics it's 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 really like the wild west in terms of all these theories that are being mm. propagated or propounded uh, to explain, for example, how the universe started. And uh, they're all very interesting and they all have uh, good underpinnings, great theoretical backgrounds, but uh, which one is the right one? And it's, it's almost like a, uh, a uh, struggle, not a struggle, but a uh, combination, of a catalog of ideas, mm. and uh, it's, a, it's a quest to see which one wins. And so that's the way science works in some sense. There might be uh, different theories and then you kind of see which one is so going to win. So you're, su you're suggesting, in other words, that math is both more rigorous and more uh, aesthetic than, than science, sort of at the same time. And I'm trying not to offend anyone well, while I'm saying that. <laughs> I'm sure all the physicists have walked right, out right, by right. now. Um, are, do you think we're born with an innate knowledge of math um, or is it all learned? So uh, there have been experiments done. Uh, Keith Devlin is a mathematician. He's written a book about this. And um, when you look at babies, for example, uh, just newborn babies, they are able to differentiate. They have a number sense. So they are able to differentiate between, I don't know, one and two, definitely, uh, one and many. And so there have been experiments that show that. So there is some inherent uh, number sense. And this, of course, carries over to other life forms. Like birds can count up to three or four, hmm. uh, something like that, and then they say many. And some other creatures also have that built in. And that maybe that's through evolution. I don't know, but but there is some sort of math sense that is. But in but there. yet, I mean, as a, a a recovering journalist, I remember that editors always, you know, harped on the fact that I should use as few numbers as possible in my stories. Don't say thirty-three percent. Say one third. Um, so I just wonder if we process numbers in the same way that we process words. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, your novels are not filled with a lot of numbers, for instance. Yeah, I, I have to really work to uh, put in the word calculus in my second novel. <laughs> uh, but yeah, there's no, there's no uh, math in them. So uh, what you're saying, though, is uh, about just numbers. And again, I would, I would say that when you think about mathematics, it's more than just numbers in the sense that, you know, there are all these ideas. Uh, so numbers are the basis of everything. But then uh, you have things like order relationships, you know, something being greater than something else. And that, I think, is uh, probably something that, I don't know, is that inborn? Do we learn it? It's, it's, it's so let's, let's talk about numbers. Um, I was just fascinated with how you write about numbers. Um, numbers to me, you know, just Number six is the number six. Um, uh, but you describe, you say that they come with their own genders and personalities. You, and you describe, this is my words, numbers as almost having kinetic qualities. Um, now your words, you say that they're playful, they dance, they are variously, and this is all from your book, restless, thoughtful, elated, disgruntled. You describe a long, rippling string of digits as being, quote, like eels with exposed skeletons. You say that sometimes numbers get stuck, and occasionally they get eviscerated, quote, slicing numbers open to examine their guts. Um, it's a very visceral uh, description of numbers, and so I'm not suggesting that you're nuts, but do <laughs> n are numbers alive for you? Um, in well, a way? Okay, so, so, so first of all, I, I'll tell you where this came from. Originally, this book was a novel, uh -huh. and uh, it was called The Godfather of Numbers. Ah. And so the numbers were truly alive there, and everything okay. was predicated on a story. I mean, it works where, wonderfully. Well, it, it thanks. It makes them come alive. But, but, uh, but you know, when, when I had that uh, original thing, there were numbers that uh, they were actually fighting with each other, and, you know, they had little rivalries and so on. So everything was based on that, and that didn't quite work in the sense that I couldn't get a publisher. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, so, uh, so, even with the word "Godfather" in the title, yeah, yeah. In <laughs> fact, in fact, one publisher said, "No one knows what that means anymore. The younger generation, they haven't seen that movie. They so just see the word numbers." So, so yeah. So, 
So, uh, so I wanted to retain some of that, and that's where you see the numbers. But what's also interesting is that I had a student in a class, an honor seminar once, and she, um, she suddenly complained to me. She said, would you mind not using blue for the number six? She said it just made her go very tense because she had synesthesia. And she associated each number with a color. Not only that, but each number also had a personality for her. So, you know, there was a mom in the family, and there were these kids who wore their baseball caps backwards and so on. And uh, so that was very interesting, and, and that's perhaps one of the things that I stole from my students. It would make a great children's book, if nothing else. Yeah. Um, so, um, now I'm getting to the tough questions. These oh, have all okay. been easy so okay, far. Okay. Okay. So imagine everyone in this room suddenly disappeared. There are no humans in this room. Okay. You mm -hmm. with me? So we would say, as a sort of omniscient outside observer, that the the microphones still exist, and the books here still exist, and the carpeting and the chairs still exist. Do numbers still exist outside of human consciousness? That's a great question, and uh, this is something that's a controversy in mathematics from the time of Plato. Uh, Plato thought that all, so all mathematical concepts, they exist in a perfect idealized world, which was separate from what we uh, experience in our bodies and in our physical uh, uh, domain. And um, so in his view, mathematics was something that already existed. All theorems exist. Their perfect proofs exist. And once in a while, the clouds part and you know mankind is able to see this revealed bi wisdom so math is a process of discovery the other point of view is that we actually create numbers so that they don't have any intrinsic existence but we define what a number is we associate it with this abstract idea of one two three four and all of mathematics is something that humans in invent and so in that view uh, there wouldn't be any mathematics if there wasn't uh, yeah, humans. Where does Manil fall in this? So Manil, I fall right in the middle. So, <laughs> so you know, I'm, I'm going to hedge my bets. Uh, and I think that, as I, as I actually trace out in the book, is the right uh, way to, to view this, because it actually tells us something about, uh, it's a metaphor for what we know of our own existence outside of math. I mean, are we... Are we something uh, that just happened by chance? You know, is, does life exist just by some coincidence? Or is there some sort of other force, some sort of uh, uh, guiding or cognitive uh, force that has actually planned this or made it appear? You know, that's a very similar question to does math exist because we uh, have a cognition, uh, cognitive uh, effect and make it appear, or does it exist by itself? Uh, and there are several examples that prevent you from pigeonholing math in one or the other uh, branch. Mm -hmm. So you can't really, you know, for each example, you, you might come up with uh, plenty of things in mathematics that mathematicians abstractly, uh, you know, they, they like to play games in their heads, and so they abstractly came up with things like uh, there's a whole thing called group theory where they looked at abstract structures and came up with uh, all sorts of things. There are uh, many examples in number theory where, again, people were just playing around with numbers and coming up with things. Well, all of these actually turned out to be uh, models for the universe. Hmm. Uh, for example, group theory is something that physicists use to figure out what uh, elementary particles should be, and it actually fits quantum physics very perfectly. So how did that happen? Uh, and you, you use the word playful a few times, and you describe mathematics as something that is playful. But when you're doing math, are you playing? I think so, yes. For, uh, you know, uh, and that's, that's one of the things that would be great to inculcate in children as well, uh, that math is a game. Uh, you have certain rules. You play around with them. You see how far you can go with them. Uh, you see what variations you can um, come up with. And so... Um, that's something that, um, you know, there's a, there's a, a famous mathematician, uh, Hardy, who uh, wrote a book called A Mathematician's Apology. And one of the things he said was that playfulness of math is what attracts him to it. Mm -hmm. That he actually uh, has an aversion almost 
to parts of mathematics that are useful because he feels that the playfulness is what really drives the aesthetic qualities well, that, that of that. That leads to my question, next, next question about abstraction. You describe abstraction as practical. Quote, with abstraction you can quickly detect patterns, extend them, and even connect seemingly unrelated phenomena. Now, I've written a book on philosophy, I'm all for abstraction. Most parents would tell their kids to stop being abstract and be practical, but you're saying that abstraction is practical. Can you explain that? Yeah, so by abstraction what I mean is the ability to look at certain data or certain phenomena or whatever and try to get the gist of it. Uh, try to figure out what is actually happening uh, behind what you actually are observing. So what is actually driving this? And if you can get that gist out, you might be able to identify it in other situations. So that's what mathematicians do. Um, in my career as a researcher, I've often come across problems that engineers have posed where they've come up with an example and they're getting some weird results from some sort of calculation they've done. And uh, the mathematicians then look at that problem in a more general sense, in an abstract sense. We reduce it to uh, not numbers but letters and you know X and Y and so on and then we create a model that somehow uh, mimics what has been done but is more general, more, more abstract. Then we play around with that and in that model by uh, playing this, uh, this game we're able to come up with different types of behavior that then might explain not only what was observed by those engineers but might also be observed in some other uh, context and as well. And you do that by abstracting, yes, basically. Yes, yes, exactly. Um, randomness. Um, it's something I, I think a lot about, actually. Um, and randomness, along with chaos, which we'll discuss in a second, has, I think, sometimes a negative connotation uh, in our world. But you say it's essential for the construction of the universe. Uh, and you go on to say that an irrational universe is one that possesses a touch of whimsy, of mischief, and it's there more, therefore a more interesting universe. Why is randomness good? So um, I guess the um, key thing that randomness comes up in is uh, some sort of biological selection uh, where you find that you get more diversity due to randomness where things are uh, you know, maybe mating or whatever, there's a new genetic structure. But even before that, if you look at uh, how you know, most, most uh, attempts by uh, bi biologists or mathematicians and scientists to come up with an explanation how life might have generated, spontaneously perhaps, uh, most of these depend on some sort of uh, context, some sort of models where there is great uh, uh, interaction between different pools of chemicals and uh, you need several possible interactions uh, before something actually interesting might occur. So another word for randomness is opportunity, in a way. Yeah, because if you have these things interacting in all sorts of different ways, then maybe one of them will actually lead to something that I, is I useful. Mean, I'm thinking in our everyday lives, you know, you can either shop at a wonderful bookstore like this or go to a certain online retailer whose name shall not be uttered here and I prefer to shop here, not only because of the great staff, hi staff, um, but because of the randomness, that I don't know what I'm going to find on these tables. Um, might be something good. There's an element of surprise. I mean, that's a, a simple example of randomness in our lives. Yeah, exactly. And uh, one of the interesting things uh, while writing this book was, since I'm trying to use the numbers to come up with everything in the universe, uh, at one point I come up with irrational numbers like pi, for example. We know that pi, when you look at the uh, decimal expansion of pi, uh, we know that um, it never ends. And um, you can think of that as a sort of very, very elementary method of randomness. So it's almost like you know the irrational numbers are the proto-random numbers that there are. Uh, so anyway. There are these different categories of numbers. There are reals, naturals, um, irrationals, um, 
Wackadoodle? No, that's no. not a term. Yeah. Not yet, okay. Yeah. Yeah, um, and, and each of them comes with its own hat and <laughs> own features and all that. And personality, yeah. right? Yeah, personality. Yeah. Um, so uh, on a serious note, as we're sitting here tonight uh, in Florida, Hurricane Ian is coming ashore. And that got me thinking about the section on your book, um, and I may be conflating two ideas here, so okay. you're me right if I am. Exponential growth, which we saw during the COVID pandemic and right. other examples, uh, and the notion of, of chaos. Mm -hmm. So weather forecasters, they're very good about, you know, the Capital Weather Gang can tell us what the weather's going to be like tonight, and with some great degree of certainty, they can tell us what it's going to be like tomorrow morning, but you start to get three, five days out, it gets shakier, 10 days out, 20 days out, forget it. So no one 20 days ago said Hurricane Ian is going to come ashore as a Category 4 in this particular part of Florida at this time. Now, is that because the meteorologists are not very bright? Is it because weather systems are just naturally chaotic and therefore unpredictable? Or is it because there's simply too many variables and we cannot process them all? So um, or I think something else, maybe. Yeah, no. I th actually, the, I think the key thing uh, is that uh, it's it's about the chaos. And what does chaos mean, actually? Uh, well, in the early '60s, uh, there was a meteorologist, Lorenz, and he was doing a very simple program where he was putting in all these uh, measurements of rain and temperature and so on, and predicting what the weather would be in a few days, or you know, let it run. Uh, and he found that. Suddenly, when he was doing these experiments, these calculations, uh, something was very different from what he had just done. And he went back and said, what have, I, what have I changed between this calculation and this calculation? And all he had done was he had taken some numbers of the rainfall or something like that and chopped them off after something like the sixth digit, the sixth decimal. So he had made a very tiny change just to you know, make sure that it wasn't a long number. And just that tiny change where he changed the sixth decimal created these enormous changes as he cranked through these calculations such that, you know, 10 days on, the weather was completely different. The forecast was completely different. Why? And the reason for that is that the weather, the weather calculations is chaotic, which simply means that if you change the initial conditions slightly, they can cause a great change so in, chaotic in, in that sense is not a lack of order. It's not anarchy. So chaotic is, yeah. So, so actually that's one of the interesting things that uh, as uh, there is something called the Lorenz attractor, and what that shows is that you cannot really predict things, but if you had everything correctly, uh, what happens is that the trajectory of the, uh, of the uh, predictions you make, you know, let's say you're predicting the temperature, the predictions will go in some line and it'll twist around and go this way and that way, but it actually makes a figure. So there is some order in the way it's actually going. Mm -hmm. And if you just look up Lorenz attractor, it looks like a butterfly, which is a big coincidence because uh, the paper he wrote was, can the flapping of wings of the a butterfly- the famous butterfly yeah, effect. Can cause a storm somewhere in Texas. And the answer is yes, basically. And the answer is yes, yeah. because and, and this is a problem with weather forecasts because you can never get the rainfall exactly right. You can never get the temperature exactly right. And so when you put in that as input, you're always going to have a slight problem. You're always going to have a slight inaccuracy. And these systems basically magnify that as you iterate these so systems. So a small mistake becomes a huge mistake. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And that's very different from... Uh, the kinds of things that we are often used to, like usually, you know, you, you, you exert a small force and something won't move much. It'll just move a little bit. But here, exerting a small force through this inaccuracy, and this thing goes flying off. Or like you push your door open too hard and your car drives away, something unrelated. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right. <laughs> okay, we're going to get increasingly far out, uh, literally and figuratively, before turning it to uh, questions from you guys, so think of your questions. Um, okay, rapid fire. Alternative universes. Yes or no? Exist or no? <laughs> Mathematically, yes. Okay. You must be familiar with the turn of the century book called Flatland. Yes. So Flatland, as some of you may know, was written by, do you know who? Because um, I don't. <laughs> it, it was it, it's some weird name. Some weird right, name yeah. guy in, a, yeah, in the I early 1900s. Remember. And it's a world where uh, it's two-dimensional. 
and one of these uh, inhabitants of this two-dimensional world escapes to three-dimensional world, comes back to two-dimensional world, tries to explain to everyone what the third dimension is like, and they think he's just nuts. And that would be what it's like if any of us experienced the fourth dimension. Yeah, and I, actually that was one of the things in this book, like how do I talk about the fourth dimension? And uh, the way that mathematicians do it is that when we are confronted with, you know, trying to imagine a four-dimensional or five-dimensional graph, we basically think of three dimensions. That's the honest secret, you know, right. because you can't go any further than that. Right, we don't have the capacity to right. imagine that. Um, okay, symmetry. Beautiful or not? Very beautiful. Um, if you look at, although with, with uh, so here is, here is. You have that little experiment with, with the, the Mona Lisa. With the Mona Lisa. Yeah. So here's the thing. If you take the Mona Lisa um, and just take her, half her face, and replicate her on the other half, she starts looking a little ugly. So you say, okay, let's make her even more symmetric. So let's cut her in two and then flip her this way so that it's, you know, symmetrical, not just like that, but like that as well. That doesn't work either. She looks even uglier. Uh, well, if you keep adding flippings and keep chopping her up and making her more and more symmetric, what will happen at the end is you will get this nice circular diagram, and it'll be very soothing. She'll be beautiful again. So it's this symmetry. But unrecognizable. <laughs> unrecognizable, but here's the thing that's not in the book. I tried it with Trump's picture. <laughs> And, and, you know, I cut him up into tiny pieces, which was kind of fun anyway. <laughs> but, but then I assembled it again. And fractal. Did he go fractal? No, not fractal. Okay. But I assembled it again, and he was completely harmless. I could actually put him <laughs> up on my wall <laughs> as a nice little circular painting. <laughs> and I, I suppose if you, if you hate Biden, you could do the same thing with him. <laughs> um, nature, good at math or bad? So nature is uh, very interesting because she's trying to, in my view, Usually, usually nature is uh, what's given to you, and then you use math to try and approximate it. Here in this book, the, the, the idea is reversed. The math is the central truth of the universe, and nature is trying to actually use it and create, you know, physic I mean, physical stuff out of it. And she's kind of a little upset about this, pissed a little bit, because why, why is she not getting the credit? So she actually adds her own little random things and changes things and so on so that people give her credit. So and she is a fast learner. She's a very this fast this learner. This is the, the, the phenomena of emergence, um, which is fascinating. Uh, the, the, I think the other term for it is self-arising. Self-arising, self-organizing. Self-arising yes. is a wonderful term. It, it's basically something out of nothing. It's order out of chaos. It's new patterns. It's the tendency for nature and the universe to increase in complexity on its own without anyone saying, I'm going to make this complex diagram. It, it just happens. Is it that ha right? It happens from very simple rules. Um, one very simple example is supposing you have a whole bunch of particles that are facing in different directions and you they're in a knot and then you sort of somehow order them to step one centimeter away from where they were. Well, since they are facing in different directions, they will each step one centimeter away, and what you'll end up with is a nice sphere of radius one, because they've all stepped in different directions and they've created this sphere. So that's a very strange thing, you know. You're suddenly getting this uh, very nice figure out of. And just it happens asking with them. ants, and it happens with people. Yeah, right? the ants is a great uh, example. Uh, if you look at ants, you know, when they find food, they go in different directions, and they might have different paths towards the food. Well, what they do is they drop pheromones as they go along so that other ants can follow them. And what happens is if a path is short, then uh, they'll be e able to get there and back much quicker. So that path will have more pheromones. And that's why it'll attract more ants. And those will drop even more scent. And it'll start attracting more and more ants while the longer pieces, the longer paths, will just fade away slowly and die off. So, so suddenly you have these ants that have optimized this, and this is swarm intelligence, but there's no actual... There's no individual intention yes, on yes. anyone's part. Exactly. Yeah. I, I find it fascinating. In, in my book, The Geography of Genius, I write about how there's emergence in these cities of genius, that all of a sudden you start to see breakthroughs in all kinds of fields, because you know once the, the sparks start flying. Um, is there any difference between uh, complex and complicated? I always thought that... 
I describe myself as complex, but my spouse is complicated. <laughs> um, or are they the same? Because I think complex is a more positive connotation. Yeah, I think so. And I think if you know the math, complex can no longer be complicated. Einstein said, if you can't explain something simply, it means right. you don't understand it well enough. So you obviously understand all of this very well. Um, I have just a couple more questions. How are we doing on time? We're going to go to questions soon? Okay, let me, let me ask one or two more questions, uh, more personally. Um, did you know that of all STEM people, scientists, mathematicians, the one discipline where, where on a survey they say they believe in God more than others is mathematicians? Oh, really? I Two and a half times more likely to say they believe in God than biologists, for instance. So um, in, is math and religion, math and God, are, are they reconcilable? Um, are they compatible? Uh, very much so, just because uh, mathematicians believe in axioms where you start with uh, initial assumptions and uh, these axioms start with irreducible concepts like Euclid mm. talked about points. Well, you can't really define a point. He talked about lines. You can't really define a line. So uh, perhaps the two and a half times likely uh, is because people are just saying, okay, I'll put God in as a word and it'll mean something that might not be the same meaning uh, that Hinduism might have or a, an organized religion might have. Hmm. So all I'm saying is there, there's some elasticity to the concept of God, so I wonder if that's what's playing in. That might be it, that might be oh. it. Anyway, I thought it was interesting. Um, so um, it seems that people are either good at math or they're good at writing, and you're excellent at both, damn you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, seriously, can't you just be good at one thing? Do you have to be so good at both? I mean, your novels, The Death of Vishnu and the other two, are beautiful. They are complex, but not complicated. They are beautifully written. There's a simplicity to them. And then, you know, that's how I knew you first, you know, was as, as a novelist, right. an Indian novelist. And then there's this whole other side of you. Now, you've not written a book on math until now. Were you keeping these two parts of yourself separate and now you're just coming out as a math person or what's going on? So there's actually a continuum there because if you remember my books, they're uh, The Death of Vishnu, uh, The Age of Shiva, and The City of Devi. So they're looking at Hindu mythology and they're looking at this whole cycle of creation and uh, destruction and how that plays out in, uh, in the universe in some sense, so, yeah, you know, reduced to a microcosm of a building or a city of Bombay. Uh, and so in some sense, I figured, hey, let's look at creation from a slightly different point of view. Mm -hmm. And so that's where the mathematical ideas behind this book, in a way, can be related to what I've done before. Mm. Does your math inform your, your fiction? Does your fiction inform your math? Or, or do they, I mean, it sounds like they do. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, certainly with this book, you know, I was first going to write uh, a nonfiction book, and then I said, oh, hey, I'm a fiction writer. I should right. write fiction. Well, that, you know, things didn't work out. So, so I rewrote it as nonfiction, which actually, I have to say, does work better. The problem with using fiction to put across mathematical ideas is it takes a long time to, to really, you know, talk about dialogue and this and that, because in fiction you have to be elusive. You can't really hit people over the head with an equation or a formula or anything like that. You have to kind of yeah. work it in somehow. I would say it, formulas and equations in your novels, not, not a winning formula. Not a winning, but, uh. but you know, in case you're, yeah, I, when I was writing this book, there's a famous kind of uh, saying that each time you add a formula, you reduce your audience by one half. <laughs> so, so I was very careful. That's a good one. I right, was very careful not to add too many. My last this. question, then we're going to go to the audience. Um, so your book is a giant what if thought experiment. So I'm going to give you a what if question. What if everyone in this town, especially the politicians, saw the world and thought mathematically the way you do? Would the world be a better place, a different place? Um, I know you're, you're not proselytizing your book, yeah. saying we should all be mathematicians, right. but what if everyone was a mathematician, especially those on Capitol Hill, for instance? Yeah, I, well, on the good side, there would be a lot of logical deductions and, you know, very careful, thought-out things. On the bad side, mathematic mathematicians can be a little nitpicky, and they can start arguing over very minor things. And quirky. And quirky. So uh, I'm Pythagoras just not... Pythagoras and beans. 
Pythagoras, yeah, he told his brotherhood not to eat beans. <laughs> they caused gas, and that's, that's why they were excluded from eating beans. Okay. Well, One of the reasons. Yeah. Uh, so, but, they're but quirky. Yeah. So, so I don't know if they're good examples of mathematicians who are politicians. Yeah. Uh, uh, so I don't know. Uh, it's something that we might want to find out, but it would be an interesting it. thought yeah. experiment. Right. What is it? It would. Okay. It would, yes. Thank you so much, Manila. Thank Look you. Very much. Enjoyed it. So, um, okay. Now get your cu quadratic and cubic equations ready because the audience is about to ask questions. I know they can. You don't have to use numbers. You can use words. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Math phobia. Yeah. <laughs> it's all you. Um, first, I want to say I got here a little bit early, early and had an opportunity to start reading your book and was hooked in the 20 or 30 minutes that I had, so Thank you. I'll eventually pay for this. And <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. um, Money is just an abstraction, don't worry. Right. <laughs> and uh, um, I don't know if this is an interesting question, but when you were talking about the, uh, the equations for weather prediction and mm -hmm. how they're inherently chaotic and, you know, where the, the guy sort of just chopped off like the right. seventh digit, right? And the results were very different. I can imagine somebody saying, well, maybe if he had chopped it off at the eighth and the ninth or the tenth digit, everything would have kind of cooled off and it wouldn't have been so chaotic. Um, I'm just curious, in, in physics, there's kind of the idea of the, like Planck's constant, mm -hmm. right? Which is sort of that boundary between certainty and uncertainty in all different ways. Do you think that could sort of, the, the existence of that would keep chaotic equations inherently chaotic? no matter what we try to do as humans and, and our precision. So, so the problem is that if you, um, if you truncate it after eight digits or nine digits or 10 digits, uh, what would happen is you would only delay the onset of these chaotic phenomena. So um, in terms of the Planck's constant, that actually I do mention it in the book in the sense of could we have a, a universe that is entirely discrete, contains only discrete points, isn't continuous. Uh, at some point I talk about a time interval, and if you think about it, that might be the only way we truly experience infinity, where between any two time intervals, there's an infinite number of points. So you could say, you know, we are actually living through all these points. But then physicists also have these theories where everything is in terms of discrete points. So there's a Planck's constant, which essentially measures the least amount of space. It's the smallest space unit where you know everything becomes, everything is discrete. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, beyond that unit, you can't really have things exist the same way. Same way in, in time, there's the smallest time constant, similar to Planck's constant. And if you just had discrete, uh, you know, not continuous time, but discrete time, then you'd be living through each of those separately. So uh, another thing that you have to ask physicists, I think. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I look forward to getting to that part of the book. Sure, thanks. Thank you. Anybody else? Anything at all? All right. Um, you mentioned that you sent your book to the Pope, and I wonder yeah. what kind of conversation you'd like to have with him. So uh, the reason I sent my book to the Pope was uh, because uh, right in the beginning, when I wrote that article for the New York Times, I was watching it trend upwards, and it was the most emailed for the day. Then it was still the most emailed over two days. And then it was, uh, you know, the New York Times used to have something most emailed for the week. And it was really going up, going up, going up, got to number four, then number three. And then it got to number two, and I was saying, okay, most emailed for the week. Well, the Pope at that time, made these uh, very provocative statements about gays and abortion and so on. And he just you know, leaped forward and just jumped over me <laughs> and grabbed the number one spot. And so I always said, OK, I may have written this book just to get back at him. I don't know. <laughs> but he's but also a scientist by training. Yeah, he is, actually. He's got a, his schooling was in chemistry. And I use that in the book because he actually uh, represents the religious slash scientific uh, view throughout the book.
So anyway, I said I have to send this to the Pope, and I did. Uh, I actually tried to get an audience with him through a friend who knows the big cardinals there, but they said nothing doing. Uh, <laughs> so I did send a book, and uh, I did get a response, not from the Pope, not from the Pope, by one of his underlings who said that the Pope has, uh, is going to look at my book and he sends me his blessings. <laughs> so that's good because that means that, you know, I have that sheet now so he can't sue me for anything I've written. So, so that's good. Yeah. Maybe one more question? Anyone? Okay. Okay. So. Hi, Drew. Hey, Manil. So my, my question is only half formed. Okay. Which is we, we our numbers are based on ten, you know, base ten, I guess, because mm -hmm. we have ten fingers. If we had eight fingers, how would things change, you know, or or would irrational numbers be irrational if we were base eight or base seven rather than base ten? And how does that play into your universe? Is it a base ten universe only, or can we look at numbers with another base? So uh, yeah, you can look at numbers with any base, starting with base two, and uh, the irrationality doesn't, you know, irrational numbers, they w you would still have irrational numbers. Uh, what, what would change is that you would have a very different system of counting, and I actually mentioned that in my book. I'm teaching a class on this uh, book uh, right now, and so I had the students convert numbers from one base to another. One of the nice things, uh, I wish we had 12 fingers, actually. <laughs> it would be great. And for the following reason, if you use base 12, it becomes very easy to divide things exactly in three. You know, base mm -hmm. 12 has all these divisors. 10 only has two and five. Mm -hmm. And so you can divide it into fifths or, or halves. Base 12, you could do six, I mean, one, one, one half, mm -hmm. one third, one fourth. Um, so, so you have a lot more choice. So, so, is so pi let's try to, yeah. Is pi an irrational number in any base? Uh, I believe so. Uh, right. So uh, I would have to, yeah, it would be just because I think so. So irrationality, I, 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 need, to, I need a piece of paper. Irrationality will transcend. Jeff can answer. We have at least one mathematician there. <laughs> yes, yes, the answer is yes. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Sure. How many mathematicians does it take? No. How many, math <laughs> how many mathematicians are there today here? <laughs> okay, so there's a few. All right, yeah. it adds up. Um, Okay. Uh, uh, I'll just say one thing. Yeah. Uh, my husband, who's there, uh, has a rule that I'm not allowed to have more than three mathematicians at any party. <laughs> <laughs> because then we just talk about math. And that, unfortunately. Is that an arbitrary number three? No, <laughs> he, he's done it through experimentation. <laughs> and that includes me, so I have to count myself, too. So you can invite me anytime, because I will not count as a mathematician, but um, I'm enlightened about math thanks to your book. Thank you for writing it, and thank you, everyone, for joining us tonight. Thank you. Thank you.